Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to New Books and Intellectual History, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. My name is Alexandra Ortolia baird and today I'm joined by Lauren Kennedy and Jennifer Phone to discuss their edited volume, Crafting Enlightenment, Artisanal Histories and Transnational Networks, part of the Oxford University Studies in the Enlightenment series published by Liverpool University Press in 2021. Lauren and Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Alexander, for having us. It's a fabulous, fascinating volume um, with so much to offer. But before we kind of delve into the pages and think about artisanal enlightenment, could you both give us um, a, a little bit of background to yourselves and and your uh, your academic trajectories and maybe tell us a bit about how you came together to collaborate on the volume? I think this will be a really nice story for your listeners, um, if you don't mind, Lauren, start, starting off. Um, so for myself, I'm actually uh, an architect. I trained in architectural design for a number of years. I worked around Europe, and then I was doing my PhD and was uh, finishing up some archival research. And I was a fellow at the, the Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art, the INASHA in Paris, and um, came across Lauren, um, actually, at an evening lecture um, by, I think it was Christopher Wood, wasn't it not, Lauren? It, it was. It was on Anachronic Renaissance. It was on Anachronic <laughs> Renaissance. And I think we went to a party afterwards, which was rather <laughs> nice. And then Lauren and I had a few, you know, evening beverages together and we were just chatting. And um, I think that's where, where it began. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, I so I am a an art historian by training. I um, I studied early modern European art and architecture at uh, NYU, and I am at the moment an uh, assistant clinical professor in um, the University Honors Program at the University of Maryland College Park. And before this, I held a position in the research and academic program at the Clark Art Institute in, in Williamstown. And it was there at the Clark that I had the opportunity to, to host a gathering around a scholarly theme. And as Jennifer mentioned, we met in Paris as graduate students. And I think right away, we um, found a kind of kinship in, in ideas, though we work on and we continue to work on um, different things. Um, and in the, the the long 18th century, so it was at the Clark that I I asked Jennifer to uh, collaborate with me, and together we settled on a theme for a colloquium, uh, which was artisanal praxis and state power. And Jennifer and I worked together to invite a wonderful group of, of scholars and curators to meet us in the bucolic Berkshires, um, and that's where this. A beautiful college town, and that's where this project started, and um, the 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 origins of of the book that we are going to be talking about today. Yeah, and I think it also goes to prove, Alexandra, that I think um, some of the people that you meet um, during your doctoral studies and during graduate school um, can become fruitful and wonderful collaborators later on. I'm actually uh, currently a senior lecturer in architecture, and I'm based actually in Australia at the University of Sydney. So even after all of these years, I think it's been great to not only become friends and you know, colleagues, of course, with Lauren, but to sustain and complete a project um, of this particular scope. So I think it does go to show that I think a lot of these longstanding collaborations you know, are started from very early on in your academic career. It's almost the academic version of a, of a meet cute in a, in a film, <laughs> it's isn't it? It's, sure. it's, yeah. and, and, and you know, at this already at this juncture, it makes me think, oh, I'm so excited to hear about what the two of you will be going on to collaborate on in the future. But um, <laughs> maybe that's something to talk about um, a little later after we've tackled crafting enlightenment. Um, so the book starts by talking about what you call artisanal capitalism um, and about what our current day understandings are of this term artisanal and what it means to be an artisan um, before then going on and putting this into conversation with what the history of the artisan was in, in the 18th century. And that was especially very much so in the, the context of Diderot and d'Alembert's Encyclopédie. I was wondering if you could perhaps give us a, a brief overview of, of this history of kind of the artisan as a, as a figure and artisanal as a concept, and perhaps outline some of the tensions and difficulties that arise from, from studying this category. 
I think, you know, maybe to just kick off where the introduction in the book kind of begins is that we think about the term artisanal and it is everywhere today. And I think this is where Laura and I were starting to think about um, how this contemporary term that we think about and we see everywhere. So whether or not you are buying Starbucks coffee, which is artisanal or handcrafted items that are available on Etsy or homemade honey or jam, the term artisanal, this idea of craftsmanship and this aura of originality had, as we like to argue, its origins in the 18th century. And so this idea that we are always purchasing and coveting objects that are both well-made and well-designed for a global audience is also an enlightenment idea. Yeah. And I, I think, um, you know, one of the one of the threads that we um, we wanted to to pull out in the the introduction was the kind of false distinction that um, that Diderot and d'Alembert make between um, or between makers and thinkers, right? A kind of hierarchy that um, privileges the the intellectual over the manual, and this kind of rigid system that existed between guild artisans or academic fine artists or scientists that that proved um, difficult to to transgress. And, you know, Diderot and D'Alembert weren't inventing this binary, so to speak, but they were perpetuating these distinctions and these hierarchies in a document like the Encyclopédie. And there was also something, you know, to, to build upon that idea is that who had the right to be called an artisan, right? Who had the right to actually use such a title and who did not? And I think in the encyclopedia, there is also this idea that mechanical arts, right, were something that were fitting into a particular hierarchy. And what we wanted to also expand, though, in the book is that the historical category itself of artisan is up for grabs. And I think this was interesting when we were developing the book is that, We'd ask other scholars, I think, to, to participate in this colloquium, and some of them didn't agree with us. This was an interesting point of contention, <laughs> is that, um, you know, I'll say this from my own field, less, less so art history, but architectural history and architecture, is that, you know, there's no way that architects could be considered artisans or vice versa. And it was from that simple point that I think this introduction kind of grew out. But Lauren, as you were saying, you know, the idea that, you know, laborers were considered mindless, but artists were intelligent, savants were somewhere in between, um, is kind of our starting point, Alexandra, for the for the beginning of the book. Yeah, and I think as far as studying and categorizing artisans, um, one of the, the difficulties that we came up with is that, you know, it's such a capacious category, artisans, and their their identities are so diverse, um, even if we're talking only about the 18th century. And, you know, we came up against like, contemporary disciplinary boundaries, right? Like the scholarly research on artisans might come from sociology or the history of technology, the history of art, the history of science. And so I think with, you know, from our perspectives, me being an art historian, Jennifer being an architectural historian, and, and us having read rather widely and, and thinking about artisans in our own work, we thought, you know, how, how diverse of a group of scholars and curators can we bring together to, to think productively about these questions, about who was an artisan, how do we, how do we categorize them, how do we study them? And it's so fascinating to think that you're in many ways echoing so many of those discussions that were probably going on around the Encyclopédie regarding these categories that were that were going on and that we're still we were having like struggling. The, the 2017, 2018 version of these uh, conversations, <laughs> I like to think. And so no less than important to the volume. So we've talked we've talked a little bit about the artisans and this kind of idea of artisanal history, but the kind of the other side of this is the idea of the transnational network. And this is within your title, but it obviously resounds throughout the volume. Um, and these are the networks within which artisans that were either kind of moving quite literally or within which they can be situated. And that's either, I guess, on a more conceptual or kind of more theoretical basis. I was wondering if you might tell us a little bit about why this transnational element is so crucial to understanding the nature of what you call the artisanal enlightenment. And then we might even arguably say the enlightenment more generally. I think what is really fascinating about us choosing the term transnational, and Lauren, I think you remember this rather deeply, was 
we, we, we had a lot of go back between our editors, the editorial board um, for Oxford University Studies in the Enlightenment, but whether we should use the term global or whether we should use the term transnational. And we settled on transnational um, because in a way we thought this book is basically traveling across four different continents and it is like almost a period of more than a hundred years, you know, give or take. But we wanted to focus on both synchronic and diachronic ideas of history um, through these bottom up narratives that come up through the book, right? So the fact that something might be happening um, in Qing Dynasty China is not necessarily the same thing because it hasn't really happened yet in colonial Australia or it's already kind of happened a little bit in, in the mainstays of Europe, right? So if we can imagine like the, the transnational networks are not necessarily lines on a map, even though we've got a map, I think, on the cover, of the book, <laughs> uh, which is the irony. But but I like to think, I think that, and, and you know, we discussed this at great length, which is that the book itself was uh, a series of points or epicenters on a map, right? That in a way, they weren't the traditional routes. So they're not trade routes, they're not mobility routes. This has been discussed particularly in the early modern period, but they were epicenters that would become activated or they were fade over time, right? And so these different locations across the world were, were almost turned on uh, by, these, uh, by these artisans, by their interventions in historical events or transformations. And so in a way, you know, we can imagine that the book is, is a collection of these points, perhaps. Yeah, I think that's very well said, Jennifer. And, you know, we, we were thinking about um, kind of local histories in a globalizing world, which was the 18th century. Um, and a few of the examples, just because they're, they're very evocative, and um, I would be remiss to not, to not bring up a few of these from, um, from the case studies or the chapters within our volume. One um, by the art historian Dennis Carr. Um, Dennis is a curator of American art at the Huntington Library in San Marino, and he wrote a wonderful essay on what he called um, what he calls a multilingual object. So this um, this desk cabinet that was made in Puebla, Mexico, and Dennis writes about this object speaking the language of the colonizer and the colonized. Um, and his his essay um, Microcosm of the Spanish Empire. He's talking about this object having the form of a low country object within the Spanish Habsburg Empire, um, it being lacquered, the knowledge of which was transmitted through the Manila galleon trade, it being decorated with an indigenous map with both Nawa and Spanish labels and made by an artisan in, in Puebla. Um, so a really interesting way of thinking about how local knowledge, knowledge of place, knowledge of history is conveyed in, in essentially an object of European form. Yeah. And I think probably to, you know, contrast with what I think Dennis has contributed to the volume is our colleague, Dorothy Coe, uh, who is a professor of history at Barnard College. I think she's the chair of that department, but Dorothy's essay is also really fantastic because I think it, it rejects the idea of a kind of Europeanized uh, Western enlightenment and, um, the uh, the issue that you know a lot of these Eastern ideals were never really uh, the same or in the same registers as what we consider um, from the European Enlightenment um, and our other colleague Hai Jung Chen has actually also said you know there's an idea around alternative rationality right that is posited in these other cultural contexts in the long 18th century um, that existed outside of Europe so they were not even being mentioned uh, in these texts that so many, I think, intellectual scholars do read and cite. And so you've mentioned uh, a couple of the, the really outstanding contributions within the volume, which are, are certainly um, worth reading and coming back to. But I was wondering if you might tell us a little bit about the types of scholars who are contributing here, because you, you've mentioned two examples of, of individuals coming from fairly different disciplines. Yourselves also are from, from different fields. So I wonder if you could just give us an, an overview of this diversity of contributors. I think there, yeah, yeah there's a, probably a heavy weighting towards historians <laughs> more generally, um, but of different stripes. And I think we have... Um, Myself and Valerie Neg, who is also a architectural historian, but based in Paris. We have a number of curators uh, who are also uh, as part of the volume, Frédéric Dessas, uh, as well as Dennis Carr. We have, you know, almost pure historians um, such as Dorothy, 
and Neil Camel from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, we also have scholars of uh, science studies and history of technology, uh, our colleague Chandra Mukherjee. So I think what is bounds us together, I mean, and, and in a way brings together the core of the book is uh, we've really been interested in artisans as a, as a group of historical actors in our respective areas of research. But there's also a certain dedication to both visual and material analysis, regardless of the fields that everyone comes from, right? So you'll see that in the book itself, there is a kind of deep reading of, of texts, of objects, of places, of people. And I think um, that also begins to add a fine grained layer to, to the body of the book. Yeah, absolutely. And I would just add, as the art historian, um, <laughs> that we also have con- about art history. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> that, that we also have contributions by um, Emine Fedbache, who yeah. is a um, hi- uh, historian of Islamic art at Boston College, and Shigata Ray, um, uh, an art historian at UC Berkeley. And I, I have to say, I. I don't, Jennifer, you, you can correct me on this. I don't think other than Jennifer and myself, anyone had met before this meeting. We actually, we, yeah, nobody, nobody knew each other. But, but scholars knew other scholars work. And we only realized that when we gathered in a room together. So that was one of the really um, kind of felicitous in, uh, moments of, of this starting as a, a colloquium and in person, if we can remember a time when we did that, things like that. Um yeah, it was, I think, I think it was actually out of that meeting that we had started at the Clark. This is the end of, I think, 2017, beginning of 2018. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Alexander, it was really great because, like, I think Dennis had heard of Neil's work, uh, mm-hmm. his work on Americas and material culture, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then, but, but I think what was really interesting was that, and we do owe this to our, not only our, um, the, the people who contribute chapters to the book, but our respondents as well. Everybody has a has a vested interest in artisans. And either someone's written about it, they've published about it, they've done a catalog on it, or they've done an exhibition on artisans. But everybody was really open-minded. Everybody was really vested in interdisciplinary work um, and also methodologically very rigorous. So I really appreciated that. I thought that was really great across the entire group. Yes, absolutely. And it's interesting, though, because in spite of this obviously very kind of rich previous kind of research into into artisans and thinking about it, you come at this topic from very, very different angles throughout um, the book. I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit about the structure and how it progresses, how perhaps you've you've divided up the book, because it's it's very interesting, some of the, the, the choices that have been taken here. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good question to pose, Alexander, because I think, you know, Laura and I had discussed this at length, which was how to keep the book's kind of central narrative on course, but embracing the diversity of cultural contexts that were, you know, was represented in the volume. And what we had settled upon, if you think about it, the book is arranged in in threes, almost like threesomes. So each section has two chapters by two leading scholars, and then a third is a kind of respondent um, or you know commentator, if you will. But the the third response kind of brings together the two previous themes of the of the before of the two chapters. But we also were using you know some some methods here at play as you can look through the structure of the book. So there's there's certain intentional juxtaposition and counterpoint. So the two chosen scholars for each section represent different methodologies. They might be from two different disciplines. They also work in different geographies. So they're not all Europeanists per se. Um, you know, they are working on some other part of the world of the 18th century world. And we did this purposefully, I think, to just to highlight that it wasn't just purely thematic. It was that there were certain commonalities and differences that added to this kind of fragmented nature of what we're calling the Enlightenment, right? And that there are these multiple versions of it happening in these different places. Yeah, and you know, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, Jennifer, but I don't think any of our pairings come from the same culture or geographic location. And and that was very intentional for on, on exactly. our part. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the volume is 
organized roughly chronologically. Our long 18th century begins um, in Louis XIV's Versailles, and it ends in the mid 19th century in the Australian outback with, with Jennifer's contribution. Um, and you know, one of the, the pairings, to give an example of the first um, by, by Chandra Mukherjee and Emine Fedbache, is a section entitled Envisioning Artisanal Histories. And, you know, we found parallels in our, you know, in our conversations in Williamstown and, and in their, um, the, their, the chapters they submitted in the artisanal production at the French and Ottoman courts, right? And thinking about the ways that, um, that artisans at the French court and artisans at, in the Ottoman court were, were thinking about myth-making, reaching back and, and projecting forward, telling telling histories, telling stories through their production. And I think, you know, what's also really great about the book is that, and I think a lot of our colleagues um, in the recent months that the book has been published um, have said it's going to be a wonderful resource for, for art history students, for graduate students, because I think what it does uh, successfully so far is to pinpoint certain almost um, bottom-up narratives or, or, you know, stories or contexts that have these objects attached to these very rich histories, right? And you can read the book in a number of ways, right? It can be chronological. You could also say, teach from it and say, okay, we're only going to focus on, say, the French and Ottoman courts, and we could just use that section of the book um, and maybe not look at anything else, right? So I think there's a lot of versatility in the volume as well. Um, and we've certainly gotten that kind of feedback from colleagues around the world. And it's a really effective um, tool, I actually think. I, this kind of this pairing, as, as you keep referring to it, which is a lovely, <laughs> a lovely phrasing. I like, as I like to think of it. It is, it is almost a, a kind of wine pairing of sorts because, and then it functions in this almost dialogic way, right, with this response. Yes. Um, and I think, it's, especially for those who are teaching, you know, this is a, is a really conducive um, format um, by which to explore some of these topics um, in 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 both kind of depth and breadth, um, which is which is really fascinating. But you don't just kind of act as editors, obviously, um, in the in the volume. You are you are both yourselves, as you've mentioned, contributors. And what I'd like to, to do is actually kind of pick a little bit into your own contributions because they they really help to capture this sheer diversity um, that's that's within the book. And so I thought we might start, Lauren, um, with your chapter, which is on uh, and called Interregna, the Soci uh, Société des Arts and the Scale of Time. So it's, a, it's this wonderful kind of huge um, uh, kind of concept <laughs> to begin with. Um, I wonder if you might just begin by by telling us or giving us an overview, perhaps, of of exactly what the Société des Arts was, um, and you know how I suppose it relates to this this topic of artisans. Yes. Okay. As you said, this this is huge. So I'll I'll do my best to not get mired in in the minutia. Um, the so the Société des Arts was a, a group of artisans, a collective in France, in Paris specifically, um, and it was a group whose members were dedicated to technological innovation and advancement of the mechanical arts. So this is like a quintessential enlightenment project, really, much like the Encyclo Encyclopédie was. Um, members included uh, clockmakers, engineers, painters, sculptors, architects. There was a musician, a geometer, naturalist. Um, and the group was initiated in 1728 um, by a clockmaker and a priest. So the clockmaker um, named Henry Sully and Longue de Gergy, who was the Jesuit parish priest of Saint-Sulpice in, in central Paris. Um, the Société in 1730 published its statutes and um, the statutes for the group encouraged members to concentrate on um, geography, navigation, mechanics, civil and military architecture, but of course, without neglecting any of the other arts, be they useful or simply pleasurable. So in, in theory, this sounds like a society for the advancement of the French state, right? The advancement of, of French industry. And this was a kind of collaboration or a, um, a, a, yeah, a space of collaboration for artisans who were guild masters, who were restricted to working within the guild system, the medieval guild system in Paris, 
but it also um, also contained um, artistic and scientific academicians. Um, it was patronized by the aristocratic Comte de Clermont, who was also a parishioner and a neighbor of the Saint-Sulpice Church, and the group met regularly at his home. Um, they published their findings, the inventions of their members. They occasionally awarded internal prizes. And what, what really interested me in this group initially as an art historian was the fact that there were painters, architects, and sculptors who were already members of the Royal Academies. So they already had that kind of recognition and that membership in, in a, you know, the highest society they could join, why they were attracted to this Société des Arts, right? Why they were interested in joining a collective that included clockmakers and engineers and naturalists. Um, and, you know, it's, I'll, I don't know if you have other questions for me, Alexandra, or if you want me to I just... I mean, I could, I could keep going all, all day, <laughs> but no, please, please do continue. Um, but I guess that ended up only being part of the question. Uh, I thought it would, I thought my, my research would lead me more into, into, um, thinking about that kind of hierarchy and distinction between the manual and intellectual as our conversation started this afternoon. But I realized that um, it had so much more to do with, with Catholic factionism and patronage within and around this, this um, very powerful parish in, in central Paris. And that's definitely something that I wanted to pick up on. Um, was this was this religious <laughs> religious dimension? But I think it's it's really interesting that you you'd kind of speak about it as this almost enlightenment microcosm. I mean, not that it was a microcosm. I mean, it was a fairly large society, but it, it very much reads like that. The chapter, you know, that this was almost a, a kind of a synecdoche for for so much of, of the enlightenment. Um, but just to pick up then on this on this kind of religious dimension, because what you do in the chapter is really unravel these connections between the theological and economic um, instabilities of France and the revival then of the Société in the 1730s. I was wondering then if you might just tell us maybe a, a few of or some of the ways in which these connections are manifesting themselves in the activities and the outlook of the Société. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, I, the the group came about um, as a as an initiative of the regent, the Duke d'Orléans, who was uh, Louis the Fourteenth's nephew, um, and as a way to kind of right the ship, so to speak, during the regency years, seventeen fifteen to seventeen twenty three. Um, France was a mess <laughs> when he when he stepped in as a regent. Um, they were overexpanded, overdrawn, in debt. Um, the the future of the the monarchy was was in question um, with the death of the long serving Louis the Fourteenth, and so one of the the initiatives of the regent was in addition to backing the banking system of the Scottish economist John Law, and enabling certain religious tolerances against the the Huguenots and the Jansenists. Um, was to double down on mercantilism and French industry, the technological advances that he really saw that would just that would serve the state, and clock making was one of them. And France was very much in in competition with with England here. And so he asked um, the Abbe Jean Paul Bignon, um, the Abbe Bignon to um, to initiate uh, an earlier iteration of the the société with the clockmaker Henry Sully and the their energies were supposed to be um, directed towards um, maritime navigation and solving the uh, the question or the problem of, of longitude and this is something that Sully, Sully worked on, and he had um, financial support of, of the regent um, and the backing of John Law. Uh, 
And he <laughs> kind of struggled with this, as, as we know, um, clockmakers did in the, in the first decades of the 18th century. And so by the time that the society was revived in, the, in 1728, um, again, the um, Duc d'Orléans was no longer regent at this time, the Abbé Bignon decides that he doesn't want to be a patron. He's not going to support this. And I think... I think, or I argue in my in my um, chapter that the reason for this has to do that that Bignon was from a family of parliamentary Jansenists, and um, the parish priest Longue de Gergy was um, very much using the the members of the Société des Arts to outfit and ornament his parish church of Saint-Sulpice. Um, and so one of the ways that he kind of reinitiates the Société des Arts is by asking Henry Sully to come in and construct a gnomon um, on, within the, the church of Saint-Sulpice. And the, um, the original markings that, that Sully drew uh, can still be seen. You can you can walk right across them um, it, within the Church of Sensual Peace. And it's interesting um, because obviously you're, you're working more kind of literally in part of the chapter, but this, this idea of time comes up mm-hmm. at, at multiple points, not just in your chapter, but but throughout the book. I was wondering if if maybe you might say just a little bit about how that kind of dips in and out, perhaps as a, as a light motif or even quite a larger theme, we might say. Yeah, I um I don't know that I had had thought about time necessarily in that way. I guess like time it in expanding uh, like a more expansive view of of what how we're defining the long 18th century or enlightenment. But I think the exactly. actual notion of time, yeah, is and space actually even is mm. probably um part of the subtext of the book as well, because I think not just the elasticity, I think of the long 18th century, but, but even like, you know, the, like how time is, is uh, captured or visualized, measured, right? Like if we think about the earlier examples uh, from Emine and um, Chandra's chapters, Mm. um, you know, visual spectacles um, that were made for either the French King or the Ottoman Sultan, Right. We're also we're also temporally uh, very short lived. Right. So as a form of visual and material display. Right. This, these are also mm. things that are not uh, long lasting per se. And so if we take that time and move it forwards, um, we come to your chapter, Jennifer, which is um, all the way kind of at the other end of, the, of the chronology of the book, of, of the book. <laughs> absolutely, physically at the end of the book, but also but um, very much in time. And and your chapter is entitled Miniature Domin- Domination, sorry, Mining the Worlds of Goldfields, Jewelry and Emu Eggs. It's incredibly um, kind of tantalizing. Um, and here you look at the exchanges between European settlers, indigenous peoples, and the natural environment as well in 19th century Australia. I was wondering if you might tell us a little bit about the character of what you kind of refer to as the 19th century Australian Enlightenment, which might be a, a concept that's perhaps less familiar to those who, who might work on the more traditional Enlightenment, traditional of enlightenment perhaps the, yeah. of the French in particular. I think this was also another really, uh, you could say, contentious point of the book. And I think when I first proposed this, um, even to our group of authors, I think a lot of them were like, well, you know, but it's outside of the 18th century because it's you know, <laughs> in the 19th century. And I, you know, the argument I want to put forward, and, and I say this in the chapter, is that in a way, much of the European ideals that were later translated into the Australian context you know, happened almost a hundred years later, right? So it's not to say that the some of the ideals were also changed, which I'll give examples of, but but the idea that in a way, you know, many of the European settlers and the artisans that I write about in my chapter were Austrian, British, or German. And, you know, when they settled and, and arrived uh, in Australia, and this was not until, let's say, the mid-19th century, um, they brought a lot of the, the similar techniques that they've learned um, in terms of craftsmanship uh, from uh, continental Europe you know, to 
to New Holland, so to speak. Um, but I want to kind of unpack this a bit more, which is that, you know, I think the European settlers were the beneficiaries in a way of, of Enlightenment ideals when it came to Australia, meaning they understood the value of hard labor. And this is something I kind of discussed is that they were really interested in working the land and the idea that um, they could morally improve themselves uh, by working uh, very hard, right? And working through uh, acquiring this territory. But I think at the same time that this territorial expansion was based on values of utility and industry, um, there was a heavy cost of displacing Aboriginal Australians um, who are already there, right? So always will and always will be unceded land. So I think what I wanted to pose in this idea of an industri- of an Australian enlightenment is that, you know, we also have um, a series of unheard voices, that of the Aboriginal Australians who were being featured in many of these objects and whose uh, land was being reaped and extracted. Um, and yet at the same time, they had no voice or representation in how these objects were both made uh, and displayed. And I, I personally, I find it an incredibly powerful and, and convincing argument that you make here. And I think that I, I'm sure those who were perhaps skeptical of the time frame that you kind of presented um, initially at the at the workshop or conference, you know, have probably. I, I think again, they were like, "Have you lost your mind? Or have you not checked the, have you not <laughs> the checked long the 18th scale century? Recently? Only goes backwards; it doesn't go forwards into the 19th <laughs> century." And um, I think it also posits something a bit more radical about the book more generally. Is that, um, and we've kind of mentioned this in passing during this. Uh, podcast, but but that I think the Enlightenment doesn't have a fixed set of dimensions, right? Mm-hmm. If we were really mm-hmm. going to be very good intellectual historians about this, right, we would be wanting to look at all of these different circumstances. So Australia, in this sense, w- was really an outlier, but at the same time, it benefited a lot from these connections uh, to Europe. And at the same time, I think, and you see this Um, as another set of arguments within the book, is that there are absences in the archives, right? There are lack of uh, representative texts uh, for Aboriginal Mm -hmm. Australians. Many of their objects and artifacts have not survived since the early 18th century, even since the Dutch invasion. So, you know, there are all these gaps, say, um, in how we materially analyze some of these forms of evidence, right? So, The fact that we have an Australian Enlightenment or we don't have an Enlightenment in Qing Dynasty China, it shouldn't matter, right? The fact that these ideas uh, erupt in different times and different moments, I think, is also part of the core of intellectual history. And I can confirm that in the end, Jennifer convinced everyone. So (laughs) I had to. I I did have to go around and 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 do a little bit of um, lobbying for my my idea. (laughs) But, um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I, I could tell you a little bit more about the objects themselves a bit. Maybe that's a good um, segue, which is, you know, I brought these objects first um, as images to the, to the Clark Colloquium. And it's funny because I've lived in Sydney now for about almost eight to nine years. I kept seeing these emu eggs appear in secondhand shops. And I was just like obsessed with them. You know, they were <laughs> tiny little emu eggs. They were cast in metal. They had these miniature, you know, uh, Aboriginal figurines and they had kangaroos and little emus in them. Uh, and I was just like, where, what is, what is the story behind these objects? And I had a fortuitous meeting actually with a curator, uh, Ava Serenis Real, who is I think at the Powerhouse Museum here in Sydney. And she had access to a lot of these earlier emu eggs. And I was able to include some of them, of course, in the chapter um, that you now have in front of you. But um, that's kind of where this started in a way, is that these, these emu eggs were also a strange hybrid object. They, they are inheritors of imperial court culture, but at the same time, they've been Australianized. And you make the point that these kind of worlds in, in miniature were representative of, of forms of domination of, of course, European settlement and territorial expansion. So I'm wondering if you might perhaps and tell us just a bit about, you know, the makers of of these mm-hmm. particular objects, which I should say, I mean, it's such a sh- and once again, I, I find myself lamenting that we can't show the pictures in the books. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, these are some some objects which I, I think the average reader would probably not really have seen before. They really are um, 
the word spectacular is is wrong, but um, <laughs> they're they're very unusual, and and I I think that the, the you know the average listener probably hasn't seen anything quite like these kind of combination of of silver and malachite and emu eggs um, oh, kind yeah. of mashed and together think, in these and, strange and to decorative. See them, to see them in person is so the powerhouse museum has a bunch of these emu eggs um, of which I've kind of you know displayed a few of them, but but to see and actually hold them in person is really impressive and. The one thing that did strike me was that the craftsmanship of the objects was was mm. pretty unparalleled. Like it's well made, it's well constructed. But but to kind of go back a little bit, you know, emu eggs have also been used in in Aboriginal cultures for for millennia, right? They've been used to mark uh, land, water, place, identity, um, and they've been you know incised uh, in different ways. So the Europeanized version of these is interesting because you can think of the Habsburgs and and that particular court culture, they also valued ostrich eggs, right? So you often see ostrich eggs. And I think there was a recent show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New mm-hmm. York um, that had really this wonderful set of early modern marvels. And you can see ostrich eggs actually in that show. So, you know, a lot of other scholars have theorized that in a way, you know, when many of these Austrian, British and German artisans uh, came to Australia, they began um, adapting those techniques to their local context. There were no ostriches clearly here in, in Australia, but they had tons of emus. So they thought, oh, why not? You know, it's a similar shape, egg. We can put that and, and fix it into the object. But a lot of the artisans were interesting as well. A lot of them were not from well-off backgrounds. So um, many of them, interestingly enough, uh, some of them were criminals, ironically, uh, convicts that were actually, you know, shipped to, to the Australian continent. And what was interesting is that they... Um, they were petty thieves initially. They also had previous lives, you know, doing forgery and other illicit activities. And the funny thing is when they were then kind of brought to the Australian context, they were given firsthand uh, access to precious metals. So they were able to, to work quite a bit uh, with, with these kind of really precious uh, silver and gold and, and other types of resources. So I think that that's something that's pretty fascinating. What I've noticed for like with Steiner and all these other artisans that I mentioned in my chapter is that they don't seem to have thought about the subjects that they've represented. And I think I, I put that forward a bit, which is that I think, you know, the Aboriginal Australians at the time were considered um, exotic specimens, right? And this is, I think, now wrongly, if we think about decolonizing Australian history, right, that these representations of Aboriginal Australians were their they're figments of their kind of Europeanized imagination. And so, you know, they're cast as these passive subjects in these emu eggs. Many of them you'll see holding up an emu egg. Some of them are hunting kangaroos. Some of them are being shown in these kind of framed moments. So not only are their voices absent from the archives, but they're also absent in terms of their input into any of these material artifacts. So I think, you know, since even when the Dutch had actually landed on uh, Australian shores, and this is, I think, down in, out in WA, um, there's always been this big uh, lacuna of, of kind of no, non-information about how Aboriginal Australians have, have entered into the kind of 18th century. And there's actually very little information about any of this. So I think in a way, the, also these objects represent a sort of irony is that the the metal and the silver and the gold that was actually extracted from the land uh, caused massive amounts of displacements for many uh, First Nations peoples, for many Aboriginal Australians. And so you see that the souvenirs that have survived are really the products of this kind of uh, industrial extraction. And in kind of doing that, in in presenting this, I mean, they they ultimately are are presenting what well, you are presenting um, these artisans as, as very political figures. Um, and I think that's something that comes out throughout the book more generally is this idea of artisans really as intellectual practitioners and political figures and those and actually carrying a great deal more agency and perhaps responsibility um, throughout time and, and across space um, than perhaps they have been given I guess, um, kind of responsibility for um, yeah. by historians over time. And I, I wonder if you might kind of want to say something a little bit about this this kind of shift that you're seeing across the book in terms of, you know, the role of the artisan as a kind of much more dominant political figure. 
Yeah, I think, you know, Lauren and I were, were thinking this over, uh, you know, kind of after this book has been published and, and reflecting back on kind of the, the work that's inside it. But, but the fact that I think is artisanal histories are also fundamentally um, histories of colonization, of imperialism, of decolonization, of resistance, of oppression, of migration. And so in a way, you know, they are key historical actors just as much as, say, military, political figures, scientists, um, or well-known figures of the Enlightenment or philosophs, right? So why not champion the artisan? Yeah, and there are examples in our volume two of artisans participating in in projects of colonization, right? So um, artisans as makers of technologies and um, objects and and being complicit in um, in colonialism. That's certainly the case in in my essay, um, where with the the clockmakers working on the gnomon and and longitude, um, that they are participating in the, you know, the French colonial machine. And that links very nicely, I think, back to your introduction where you're talking about this this idea of artisanal capitalism. And you've talked about Starbucks and Etsy and all of these, you know, large corporations, you know, using the term artisanal and, and kind of co-opting that. But I'm wondering if if what you see the book is also doing is perhaps reinserting the artisan into the kind of shifting dynamics of capitalism and the history of capitalism more generally. Do you see artisans in this period as perhaps paying, playing a much larger role in that, you know, very kind of swiftly changing uh, kind of capitalist history of the 18th century? I think there are certainly historians out there right now who have done some work on this. I think I was just looking at a book the other day about artisan entrepreneurs in early Cairo. It looked very interesting. But, you know, the idea that I think artisanal cultures is a great way to put it, that in a way they, you know, as entrepreneurs as well, they were responding to expanding commercial environments. Artisans were adapting production techniques and engaging with the markets that were in Europe and beyond. Um, I was just noticing, I think in the 1990s, there was a burst of quote unquote artisan studies. And this was really focusing on the American early republic. And so what's mm-hmm. very fascinating now, I mean, almost like 20 some years later, is that the revised capitalist histories are doing something different. I think one, they are trying to be more transnational, to be more global. And there are connecting different countries together through the craftsmanship of artisans. So it's not just simply Europe and another country anymore. I think you're seeing more and more complex global chains that are being formed. So from Africa to Asia, Asia to the Middle East, the Middle East back to Europe again, for example. And I think there's greater sensitivity being paid by historians now to issues of, say, enslaved labor, uh, gender and class. Mm -hmm racial identities, and of course, the inclusion of indigenous perspectives in the early modern era. On that profound note, speaking about the futures of capitalism and the histories of capitalism, um, I was wondering if I might ask you about what you're both currently working on and where perhaps this this book is leading. It sounds like, you know, this is a very kind of fertile territory and clearly a, a point of great interest for, for both of you. So I, I'd be really interested to hear perhaps what's what's up next um, in the, the monograph and article and research project pile. I guess I can go first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, well, for me... Um... I think I will be leaving artisans behind just for just for a short bit. Um, but I'm currently finishing another volume of essays, which is entitled Land, Air and Sea, Architecture and Environment in the Early Modern Era. This is with another colleague of mine, Lauren Jacoby, another Lauren, uh, who <laughs> she is a uh, she is a Renaissance art historian. And so our volume really addresses the early modern era as an important locus of environmental knowledge. Um, for what we now know about the climate crisis and sustainability. So it's much more a book uh, focused on architecture, infrastructure, and kind of environmental ideas that come out of the early modern period. Uh, And we are also working with a kind of uh, large international cast of characters. So that will be due out next year. And, you know, as an art historian, I have been thinking about anonymity. I'm not quite ready to give up uh, on artisans. So we'll see if I can drag, drag uh, Jennifer back in. Um, well, but, thinking about an- <laughs> but thinking about anonymity and um, the, the work of people whose names have been lost to us. You know, art history is a discipline that's really fixated on 
proper names and big personas tied to specific cultural and historical accomplishments. Um, you know, what does art history look like if if we center the work of of cultures rather than individuals, for instance? So I'm I'm thinking about ways to incorporate this into my teaching. And then I'm also working on a book manuscript of artisans of a different sort, um, gardeners, pattern designers, and authors of vernacular botanicals. Um, this is a book about how natural knowledge traveled differently in the pre-enlightenment period. And um, I'm writing about early modern taxonomies of, of, of knowledge and the role played by these garden patterns and vernaculars, uh, vernacular botanicals in, in ordering the natural world. These all sound like fascinating things that we'll have to have you back um, on the podcast to talk about, hopefully in the in the near future. Um, Jennifer and Lauren, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. A reminder to listeners that the book is Crafting Enlightenment, Artisanal Histories and Transnational Networks, part of the Oxford University Studies in the Enlightenment series published by Liverpool University Press in 2021. Lauren and Jennifer, thank you so much for being here today. Thank, thank you, Alexandra. Thank you for having us.